Hi, my name is Ken McCarthy, and thank you all for coming on this rainy day. Uh, we started a little late because I figured it was going to be tricky for some people to get here. Um, I'm going to cut my remarks short so that we stay on schedule, and our schedule is as follows. I'm going to introduce the day, uh, then Mark Graham is going to talk about the internet, uh, Mark Andreessen is going to talk about Mosaic, and then we're going to have a panel of people that have businesses built around the internet and Mosaic who are going to talk about what they're doing, and uh, that's going to be a very interesting uh, panel. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers and panelists for coming and taking uh, a day, a Saturday, to come and, and share their experience and knowledge with us. Uh, I'd like to thank the employees of Pandora and PacBell and Mosaic and eMedia for coordinating and working together so well. This has gone very smoothly. Uh, special thanks to Hal Josephson, uh, president of the IICS, that's the Interactive, International Interactive Communication Society. Uh, thanks also to Janine Parker, who's the incoming president. Uh, thanks to Tim Boyle, who's the founding director of the Multimedia Development Group. Uh, I feel like Jimi Hendrix here. You know. um, also, Julian Lowe, who couldn't be here today, he's the uh, director of the National Association of Media, Arts, and Culture. And the NEA just cut their budget in a big way, and he's fighting to try to regain that money. He represents hundreds and hundreds of uh, artists and filmmakers uh, all over the United States. That's what NAMAC does. And then finally, thank you to Maurice Welsh for uh, arranging this room. Maurice is the director of new media market development at PacBell. And uh, this is a wonderful room for us to do our work in today. We're here today because um, this year the internet has really changed. Okay? It's gone from being a network of networks, whatever that means, to being a, a medium, you know, a true medium. Um, how did that happen? Well, Mosaic is, is the reason it happened. And the internet now takes its place with television and radio and publishing and CD-ROMs as a medium, not just a place for computer people to hang out. Now, the numbers of people on the internet are, are very small relative to those other mediums. But that's not the point. That's not what defines a medium. It's not just numbers. How this particular meeting came to be, I was amazed to discover uh, when I did some inquiries last spring that very few multimedia producers uh, are, on, are even on the internet, let, in, let alone internet savvy. It's a small percentage. It's a growing number, but it's, it's, a, it's less than 20%. And I thought, boy, that's very odd. I mean, here we are in San Francisco. It's the world center for multimedia development. Uh, now, the internet, of course, by definition, is distributed all over the world, but a lot of the great internet talent is right here in the Bay Area. These people are literally neighbors, and they hardly talk to each other. Kind of strange. Um, it's particularly strange because the internet really needs multimedia developers. Uh, what's going to determine whether the internet succeeds or not is not technical issues. It's going to be content issues. Is the programming that's going to be on the internet interesting enough, uh, motivating enough, enlightening enough that people are going to want to tune in and use it. That's going to be purely a content issue. Nobody goes to the movies to watch the technology of the movies. They go to the movies for the story. Uh, when we think about movies, we think about the Academy Awards. A hundred million plus people watch the Academy Awards every year. How many people know about or, or think about the SIMTI, annual SIMTI convention? Okay? A very, very small number. And that's what's going to happen in the internet too. Uh, so we need content, and who better to produce digital, interactive content than multimedia title producers? They're the only people on the planet that know how to do it, that even think about it. Um, but there's also a reason why multimedia people should get hip to the internet very fast, and that is because the CD-ROM business, in my opinion, as a person from the publishing business, is a lousy business to be in. It's terrible. Okay, why? Well, let's say you spend $100,000 to produce your title. Okay, so you've got your work. Now you've got to press it. You've got to package it, and the packaging often costs a lot more than the pressing. Uh, you've got to inventory that stuff, so it's like taking a big pile of money and putting it in a closet for a while. Uh, not much fun. Uh, you've got to find a distributor. You've got to beg a distributor to take your material, true. Um, then you've got to give them a big piece of, of the, uh, the sales price. Okay? Then your distributor has to persuade a retail store to take the, the disc, to take your title. 
Then you've got to persuade a six dollar an hour clerk to take those titles out of the back of the room and put them on the shelf. And that can be sometimes the hardest <coughs> job of all. And it's one that by definition you just can't do because there's so many stores and so many people to deal with. But as bad as that is, there's even a more important reason why CD-ROMs are not a great deal for the producer. You have no contact with your customer. You have no relationship. Okay? Their relationship is with the store or the catalog that they're buying it from. Okay? Um, so you've gone through all this effort to produce this title, to excite somebody in your work, and you're not there to actually you know, be with them and, and sell them. And the most important thing is sell them additional products. And you have to go right through the, the old channel of, of distributors and stores all over again. Now the internet, the thing that excites me about it, is it allows you direct contact with your customers. Okay? No middlemen. You produce it, you distribute it. Okay? And you can build up a following and profit from that following. Okay? And one of the, one of the, sort of the, you know, the tragedies of the way our, our media system is set up so far is we all have to go through movie companies, film studios, or recording companies, or publishers to get our work done. And they don't make their decisions based on quality. They just don't. Their decisions are made on a kind of a lifeboat basis. We have so much money. To develop this title, whether it's a book or a movie or a record, it's going to cost this amount of production costs. The distribution costs are phenomenal, so we've got to, we've got to budget those in advance. And the marketing costs are going to be phenomenal. And we have limited resources. So what's getting produced these days is not necessarily the best or what's best for society or even what people are going to benefit from or be interested in, but what fits a certain parameter, what fits in the lifeboat. And again, the internet can do a lot to, to change that. And we've seen some success stories already. So I went to the multimedia people and I said, would you come to a meeting about the internet? And they said, yeah, we'd, we'd love to come. So we have a lot of multimedia title developers in the audience. Then I went to all my filmmaking <coughs> friends and said, you know, you should get in on this too because one of your problems is distribution. And while we can't distribute your independent films on the internet today, uh, what we can do is we can distribute your trailers. And as anybody knows who knows anything about the movie industry, that's the ad for the movie is those little 30 second, 60 second clips. That's enough to sell a movie. That's enough to raise a million dollars or five million dollars or ten million dollars to produce a movie. When I worked in the um, movie industry in New York, um, the, the, the procedure for doing an independent film is you make your trailer first. You take the trailer around to all the investors, they get all excited about it, they give you the money, and then you make the movie. So right now, any filmmaker with the will who can find a, a good internet person to work with could put their trailer on the internet and make it available globally and begin to attract an audience for his movie or her movie before it's even made. That's very exciting. And that's why NAMAC, the National Association of Media Arts and Culture, uh, is a sponsor of this movie. They represent hundreds, probably thousands of independent filmmakers. And uh, this is their chance to get those filmmakers out into the world faster. And then I thought about uh, record companies, and of course they have the same problems of, as book publishers. And then I thought about um, authors and publishers of print, and invited them too. And I also thought about... Who else did I think about? Oh, the advertising business. The advertising industry makes more movies than Hollywood, commercials, shoots more film than Hollywood, <coughs> is responsible for more printing than the magazine and, and book publishing industry, uh, probably does more recording than the, uh, the uh, record industry. Um, so eventually, when the, when the internet really matures, the people that are going to be on it the most, for better or worse, are people from Madison Avenue, and they're going to be the ones with the money and the resources to do all sorts of amazing projects. So I invited some of them to come as well today. So that's who's here and why and, and what we're about. Um, what I'd like to talk about in my remarks is uh, the stories that have been uh, missed this year by the media. The media has done a great job of, of hyping the internet and getting a lot of people interested in it and a lot of people excited about it. But they've told a few stories slightly incorrectly or in a confusing manner or have left certain things out. And so since I've got a podium for a half hour, I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do, correct the, the newspaper. <laughs> um, first misconception, a lot of people are talking about cyberspace and the information superhighway and this idea that we're going to create this alternate environment that we're all going to live on and everything's going to be done there. And that the measure of our success will be that everything is done there. 
and we should be gearing all our attention to create this place that's completely independent of the rest of the world. That's crazy. That's just absolutely insane. Would you start a business that only did business on the telephone? In other words, you wouldn't have a store, you wouldn't talk to anybody in person, you wouldn't send mail or receive mail, you would only deal on the telephone. Of course not. Would you have a business that only had a store but didn't use a telephone and, and didn't use, use the mail system? Of course not. The, the, the picture of every mature business is they use every conceivable channel available to them. They use the mail intelligently, they use the phone system intelligently, they use video intelligently, and they use the internet and cyberspace intelligently. So let's get rid of this idea that we're trying to create some <coughs> alternate world uh, I I that's going to be completely independent of all the other medias that exist. What we're really going to trying to do is find a place for the internet amongst all these other existing medias to integrate and, and let, it, let, the, let the different media support and coordinate with each other. Second crazy thing that I hear going around a lot is how are people going to find out about what's on the internet? You know, how many places can we post on the internet to tell people about what we're doing? Well, how do people find out about your telephone number? And how do people find out the location of your store? Okay? You advertise and you use every available means. You, use television commercials or radio commercials or direct mail campaigns or space ads in magazines or you put on conferences or t-shirts or all the other things that we do to get people to dial our telephone are the things that we'll do to get people to dial our, uh, dial up our website. Right? So we don't have to worry that, that there's not enough advertising opportunities on the internet itself to get people to come to our site. We just have to look out at all the other medias that are available and use those to drive people to our site. Make sense? The, the other uh, story that the media, I think, has gotten slightly wrong uh, is more of a missed story. And this has to do with the computer bulletin board phenomenon. Um, there are currently, according to Jack Rickard, the publisher of Boardwatch magazine, somewhere between 50 and 70,000 computer bulletin boards in operation in the United States today. And those are, those are public boards that regular people are setting up. That doesn't count corporate boards or government boards or any of those things. So what's a bulletin board? Well, it's a mini America Online or a mini CompuServe. So a guy and maybe some of his friends, they set up a PC, they buy some BBS software, they buy some phone lines and some modems, and they've got an online service. And there are 50,000 people out there doing this, 50,000 plus. And that's the story, and it's not really been covered. But the big story that, that, that the internet press missed this year is this summer all the bulletin board software makers have announced products that will allow these little bulletin boards to become internet service providers. So you've got 50 to 70,000 entities which probably represent maybe 150,000, 200,000 technically knowledgeable people. Some of them do have business savvy and have been able to build good businesses with limited resources of computer bulletin boards. Now suddenly, overnight, they're going to be able to provide internet accounts in all kinds of places that so far we haven't been able to get the internet access to for regular people. So there's going to be a flood of internet services in the next year or two. Um, and Jack, who's a pretty sober-minded individual, thinks that there are going to be an additional 10 million slip accounts uh, opened up on the internet in the next year. Why? Because we're going to be able to do it. And we weren't able to do it before. We're going to be able to do it at a cost that's reasonable. And, we're going to, and the nice thing about computer bulletin boards is unlike some of the larger services where you call and you get a busy signal or a, or a recorded message and you can never actually talk to somebody to help you, with a small computer bulletin board, these, are, these businesses are scaled to serve 500 customers or 1,000 customers. So there's all sorts of possibilities of customer training and customer service that companies that I won't mention um, aren't able to provide or, or have ceased to provide. <laughs> and it's a neat little business. I mean, imagine if you had a thousand subscribers, which you could build up over a year or two, wouldn't be hard, and you're charging $20 a month. That's $20,000 a month for a you know, business that maybe needs two or three or four people maximum to operate. That's not a bad little mom and pop type business. And, uh, you know, you might be asking, well, you know, is it really realistic that all these, um, you know, disorganized, scattered, uh, tinkerer, um, computer type people are going to be able to create a large um, media? And the answer is they, they've done it once. They can do it again. 
Um, this is a magazine that was published in 1925 uh, called Radio Broadcast, and it's a real interesting thing to look at. First, the titles of what's being discussed. Number one, a good four-tube receiver, you know? I mean, how many people listening to the radio today have any knowledge or interest or at all of what's going on inside their radio. They don't care. That's how the internet should be and will be. Um, next topic, choosing a B battery eliminator. Okay, this was important for people in, in, who were in, listening to the radio 70 years ago or so. And then finally, the million dollar question. This has never been a problem before. Who is to pay for broadcasting and how? Right? Sound familiar? Well, we worked it out somehow, and we're certainly going to work it out on the internet. Just some funny things about this picture. I mean, this could be a, a, a PC guy, right? No problem. He's got his manual open on the floor, actually a pile of them, desperately trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, batteries uh, <coughs> sitting behind his chair, and then a whole tangle of wires and headphones that no longer work, but might work again someday and could be useful for something. Um, He's smoking a pipe, and I'll leave that up to your imagination. <laughs> and, he, he, and he's extremely excited. Can you, and can you see the expression on his face? I mean, he's, you know, he's wired. <laughs> 70 years ago. And that turned into broadcasting, a multi, multi-billion dollar business. Um, the neat thing about the internet is where, where broadcasting was co-opted by large companies because of the nature of the technology you needed millions of dollars to set up transmitters and so on. Uh, the internet is not that kind of a, an animal. I think it can stay distributed and can stay an opportunity for small businesses and, and individual artists. <coughs> okay, what else have we missed in terms of stories? Um, oh, good, demographics. You know, who's on the internet and who's not on the internet. And there was a story, I think it was in the Times of the Wall Street Journal recently, that, well, the people on the internet have more time than money. Well, hey, surprise, that defines 95% of the world, you know, including me, you know. Um, I know big companies and, you know, the Wall Street Journal and publications like that like demographic studies but they make no sense in, an in a new exploding medium. What sense would it have made to do a demographic study of television owners in, in 1949? There are 8,000 of them. Let's say you'd done a brilliant study and you'd really you know, just wrung every ounce of data out of that. What would it have proven? Right? Nothing. Um, what if you studied PC owners in 1978? That would have been really, that would have told you a lot. Um, so yeah, when, a, when an industry is mature, you know, if you're, if you're trying to figure out whether you should buy an ad in steel making today, um, then demographics is really important. <laughs> you know, but with a medium that's growing, you know, 20% a month or more, it, it's not the point. The question is, is this a real medium? Is this something that's really going to last? Is it really going to grow? And the answer to that is, does it fill a need? And, and the answer to that question, I think, is yes. And that's why it is growing so fast. So disregard old demographic studies. Uh, regarding the internet. I don't see what the point is in them at this point. Okay, there was another article in another major publication saying that, well, people are setting up internet catalogs, but nobody's buying anything. Did anyone see that story? Mm -hmm. um, well, <coughs> I've had a bit of dealing in the direct marketing industry, which includes direct mail and catalogs and producing infomercials and that direct response television commercials. And I'll tell you right now, 19 out of 20 direct marketing ventures in the old-fashioned mediums of television and uh, print don't work either. It's quite hard to create a direct marketing business that works. Um, so it shouldn't be a surprise that the early pioneers of internet cataloging, some of them might not be getting the sales that they had hoped initially. Number one, the market is a little thin. <coughs> While there are millions and millions of people with some kind of internet access, not all of them know how to find catalogs. And number two, a lot of the people that are running online catalogs are they're primarily engineers, they're not marketers. And take this on faith, one of the hardest businesses from a marketing point of view to run is a direct marketing business, is a catalog business. It's a very brutal business. The margins are, are razor thin. So it's, it's, it's tough to sell things at a distance. So it shouldn't be a surprise that, that the uh, initial attempts at selling via the internet are, are running into certain difficulties. So I wouldn't take that story seriously either. Um, bandwidth limitations, I always hear about bandwidth limitations. Uh, and I'd like to give you a, an analogy. Let's say it's 1880, uh, 
and we're down at the telegraph station and the train is pulling in and you point to that train and you tell someone, someday we're going to take that train and we're going to shrink it down. We're going to put rubber wheels on it. And we're going to create a road system so that you can take that train anywhere you want to go. And it's going to be so cheap that everyone's going to have their own. Anyone that really wants to have one can have their own train. They can go drive it anywhere they want. What do you think the reaction would have been? You're nuts. You've been taking too many of those, you know, opium-laced patent medicines that they're advertising in the back of the magazines. Okay? And let's say you walked into the telegraph office. And what was the telegraph office? What well, was a line of people waiting patiently to hand their message to a technologist who would, you know, learn, who, using some binary code, would send a message, you know, to another technologist who would translate it and then pass it off to somebody. Let's say you went to that person and said, Someday you're going to have your own telegraph office. It's going to be in your house, and you're not even going to need anybody to operate it for you because you're just going to be able to speak over the line. And you're going to be able to talk to anyone you want to talk to who's got a line. Again, there's going to be the same reaction. So, you know, we're capable as a, as a race, and I think as, as a you know, human race, and, and I think Americans in particular, if I can be a little prejudiced, at um, creating all sorts of amazing leaps of technology. So, I, you know, we're really just talking about adding a little bit more uh, bandwidth. We're not talking about you know, inventing something new or, or laying the first transatlantic cable, which was quite a, a difficult physical feat. We're talking about taking technology that we already have, figuring out how to pay for it, and just installing it. So the bandwidth problems, when they'll be solved, I don't know, but they're coming. And about bandwidth, uh, multimedia developers may say, well, I can't, I can't distribute my CD-ROM on, on the internet. Why, why even bother? Well, create a product that, that works on the existing uh, network as it is. The people that produce Doom seem to be doing all right with that strategy. Um, 500,000 orders are already sitting you know, in, on their desk back wherever they are in Texas for, for store distribution. So uh, you know, there's a principle in direct marketing that if you can't get somebody to distribute your product in a store, you run your own ads, you run your own mail order ads, or you run your own infomercials, or you run your own direct response TV commercials, and that forces the larger distribution networks to take you seriously and adopt your product. So I think the internet is, is a way, again, to, you know, to force distribution. I would look at it that way if I were you. Um, let's see. I'm going to stick to the allotted time, I promise. Okay. Last story. Uh, this is a really current one. Steve Case recently got in trouble for doing what? Offering to rent his mailing list. Um, terrible thing. Okay. Why would he do such a thing? Why would he violate the privacy of his, of his customers? Well, first of all, everybody you do business with keeps your name. And everybody that's smart tries to leverage that name in some way, either by renting the, the name to another business, or co-venturing with another business, or taking a, a new product line on and attempting to sell you that product. So that's the oldest thing in the world. That's not computer-based. That goes back to the beginning of this century, to the distribution and trading and cultivation of mailing lists. But why would, why would Steve Case want to do this? Well, here's some math. You have 1,000 names. The rental price for 1,000 names is approximately $100. Okay? That's, that's about what I, I imagine America Online could get per 1,000 names rented one time. Conceivably, he could get more. Okay? So he has a thousand, he's a million members, right? So that's 1,000 thousands. So one rental of his list is 1,000 times $100, which is $100,000, which is pretty much straight to his bottom line. I mean, what, what's involved? You take the tape, you put it in the mail, and it goes to the mail house, and that's it. So 20 bucks, you know, 50 bucks. Now, there are brokers involved, and the brokers who arrange these deals take 20%, but still $100,000 per, per turn is not bad. How many times can Steve rent his list in a year? Well, there are aggressive companies that rent their list 30 to 40 times a year. Okay, so you have to take $100,000 and multiply it, let's say, by 30. That's $3 million. Not bad, okay, but it gets even better. Um, Steve doesn't have a million names. He's got 5 million names, I believe, or close to that, because there are people that have signed up, given their <coughs> information, and then not continued with the service. So it's not that number I just said, which was, what, 3 million? It's 5 times 3 million. So sitting in, in, in the back offices of America Online is an asset worth pretty much net $15 million a year, okay? So the question is not why did Steve Case try to do this, is what took him so long? <laughs> and, and this is where I'm going to end. What took him so long is that he was coming from a technology, he is a marketer originally, um, but he's coming from a technology background 
And he's just simply, I, my, un my understanding was he just simply was not aware of the income possible from uh, list rental. Uh, why? Because this whole industry of providing online services is so new that a lot of the old tricks that the print publishers have learned over the last hundred years of how to squeeze every possible dollar out of the situation, they just haven't learned. I mean, you could make money in the online services business up until this time right now simply by putting up a service because you would be the only one. Okay? We, a lot of people say, well, this is a lot like Gutenberg's Bible was going on, you know, the first printing press and so on. I don't think that's an accurate analogy. I think Gutenberg's Bible was more like the first, I think it was the Harvard, was it Mark computer, Mark I? I forget the name of it, but that original computer that, you know, they made, okay? That's what Gutenberg's printing press was like in reality. There weren't that many of them. The vast majority of people could not read. Books were still the property of popes and cardinals and kings and princes. The, the more accurate analogy is the late 19th century. Okay, what happened in the late 19th century? Well, because of a coming together of a lot of different things, all of a sudden print became very cheap. You know, we, we see print everywhere and we, we assume that it's always been ubiquitous and we assume that newspapers and magazines have always been around. Um, the fact of the matter is that's not true. We did not really have an explosion of print and print as a mass medium until post-Civil War. Um, for example, um, in 1850, there were 254 newspapers in the United States total. Okay? 50 years later, there were 2,600 daily newspapers, 520 Sunday newspapers, and 15,500 weekly newspapers. Before the Civil War, most families were lucky to have a single Bible, and it was a family Bible, and it was passed down from generation to generation. Okay? After the Civil War, you had a thing called the Sears Catalog, okay? in which a company uh, very intelligently realized, hey, we've got this printing deal that's really cheap, we've got this postal system that's incredible, we've got this railroad system, let's give out some amazing free thing, the Sears catalog, put it in everyone's home and create a vast uh, selling tool with that. Uh, but that couldn't happen until after the Civil War. And the last thing I want to say, and then I'll, we'll go on to our, our internet uh, program, look at the old timers, look at the old um, mediums. For instance, you know, we think America Online is such a hot thing because you can get electronic mail and you can play games and you can chat with people and you can read the news, right? All these amazing things. hundred years ago, the country store, you get your mail, you read the news, you chat about things, you play checkers on the, on the checker, you know, on the, you know, cheese barrel, whatever. Um, we're basically just recreating something that we already had in electronic form. And then the other thing that I would, would recommend that you look into is, is think about the Sears catalog. Think about the idea of, you know, in 1885 of giving away this marvelous print thing that was so intrinsically interesting that people loved just to page through it and, and happened to buy millions and millions of dollars of goods as a result of paging through this product. Uh, the internet makes the distribution of digital goodies extremely easy. Um, and then the last thing that I want to leave, I always like to tell people about this because everybody missed it. This was the big story that everyone missed this year. There was an invention 150 years ago that made railroad travel possible. It made um, mass production possible. It made, it forced the creation of this thing called standardized time and wrist watches and pocket watches. It uh, was the precursor of the telephone. It was what people, it, it created recorded music. Um, what else? It created broadcasting. One invention, all those things flow, flow directly out of this one invention. Does anyone know what it is? 150th anniversary this year. What's that? Telegraph. I mean, it's just so many amazing things came out of this. You know, a lot of people don't know that recorded music. Edison was not trying to create, was not trying to record music. He was trying to make a way to automatically relay telegraph messages. That, was, that little wax cylinder was meant to record dots, dots, and dashes. You were going to pull that cylinder out, stick it in a machine, and it would replay the dot, dots, and dashes so that the uh, message didn't have to be hand relayed. Um, the telephone was originally an attempt to have many, many messages, telegraph messages on a single line. And they discovered, wow, we can actually put a voice through this as well. Um, and on and on and on. You couldn't have high-speed train travel until you had a telegraph because you couldn't send a train barreling down a track at 60 miles an hour unless you knew with some degree of certainty what was going on about a half hour away or an hour away. 
And mass production came directly from uh, Chicago. Uh, the the uh, meat industry realized, hey, we could take all these cows, put them on a train, feed them all in one place, you know, dress them and send them out all at once. Um, Henry Ford didn't invent mass production. Henry Ford studied with Richard Sears. He went to his catalog company and saw how Richard Sears handled tens of thousands of orders a day. And Richard Sears went to the stockyards and the uh, slaughterhouses of Chicago and saw how mass production worked. So the Telegraph really produced just about everything that we know today. Um, and it, this year it's, it's 150th anniversary. And I think it's fitting that this is the first year that the internet can really be looked at as not just a random or not a random collection, but collection networks, but actually a medium unto itself that could probably produce as many or maybe more changes in our life. Thanks.